about him uh, we go back maybe uh, uh, on on breeding maybe go back four five years but we met uh, yep. pre pandemic very recently it gives me immense pleasure uh, to introduce him as a guest speaker today john barkata is a senior lecturer post graduate supervisor researcher and has a phd in forensic dentistry at a pre prestigious university of adelaide uh, as a uh, as a well conducted uh, uh, academician he does forensic case works he has a he's a scene team leader of uh, dental victim identification in south australia with specialized skills in maximizing the information gathered for identification of severely incidented victims he has published various articles in national journals international journals book chapters with over 200 citations recently i saw him in ifs uh, panelist as well he is a member of many forensic societies regular presence to both national and international organization including interpol the australian society of forensic odontology american academy of forensic science the international organization of forensic odontostomatology ifs he is a member of scientific committee of ifs a peer reviewer of dozens of journals his work has been recognized at various platforms he has received various awards not to mention you, it is he's just a google click away if you search him uh, as a personal experience he's a live wire in forensic odontology circuit and a very warm person to be with who will always greet you with a smile and i'm sure students and academicians tuned in today are going to learn a lot today dr john over to you thank you thank you dr man for those kind words um I will try to do my best to, to match your kind words. Uh, just going to go to the share screen. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen there at all? Share. No, no. Yes, now. Yes, yes. Now. Good. Excellent. Excellent. So. So, and can you hear me clearly? Surely. Oh, good. Excellent. So, um, I'll just move this on. Right. So, it's very important uh, when incineration cases or any sort of cases in um, where we have deaths is that uh, we need to give closure to families. This is so important uh, as as you know, there's legal ramifications if we can't identify someone. And, but main thing is what we do is humanitarianly, we want to give closure to families and uh, allow families to have their grief, their session, because you do not want to prolong it. Prolonged grief will lead to other problems. And it's been highlighted in various articles that it can lead to depression and cardiovascular disease. Um, people have trauma experience trauma and that includes uh, psychological trauma are more likely to commit suicide and there's various other things that that can occur that's detrimental to them so it's, it's what we do is a service to our community is by identifying the victims so that relatives have their closure and are able to go eventually eventually on to their lives the um obviously if we are identifying some we don't want to go to the wrong bodies for the wrong families it's 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 devastating for the families and also politically it's not very good either so it's important we get it right and um, in Australia also we're embarrassed it happens all over the world where the wrong body sent to the wrong family and uh, it's extremely embarrassing for the family the government as I said and uh, very distressing so what we can do is actually give some definite closure on on these victims in the media you've probably read about burnt beyond recognition uh, Hopefully, as odontologists, we can, we can help solve this problem. And um, I'm just gonna talk about like what happened in this Nigerian fuel tanker down the bottom there. And there was a, a petrol tanker that turned over and all the fuel just went into, into a ditch. And um, the local villagers collecting all the petrol because it's all free. And uh, unfortunately there was an ignition and over 50 people were totally incinerated. And, so unfortunately they got a large excavators which just brought to the site and they just does them a mass grave. Um, and they, they deemed that they were too badly damaged to be transported and recognized. They just didn't have the, the, the know-how of doing it. And unfortunately this leads, as I said, to never the relatives not really getting closure. There's just that lingering doubt that perhaps 
their son or their father wasn't there. He was in the next village and he's going to come back and he's just going to walk in one day. And, and even though it's highly unlikely, they still believe there's that little glimmer of hope. Unfortunately, that little glimmer of hope is when it, that presents a problem because people don't get full closure and allow to go on with their lives. They, they wake up every day hoping that maybe this is the day when the, every, all their dreams will come true and that person isn't, isn't um, deceased. Um, these fires are going to become more common uh, with global warming. We're looking at the Californian fires are similar to what's always happened in Australia with the, with the um, huge fires. Um, and also even in India, you're getting a lot more fires. Uh, I think there were 46 just up north. Um, there was uh, towards uh, Bangladesh, there were a lot of fires there as well. So these fires just don't exist in Australia, but it's, it's going to become more prevalent and odontologists might become more needed. I'm just going to give you a, an idea what it's like to travel through a, a bushfire. Um, this video, hopefully you can see it clearly there. The, um, the intensity of the heat's amazing. Uh, driving through this fire, it will actually melt the hydraulics of the car. And uh, the, with no steering or no brakes, it's impossible. You can see it's hardly, very difficult to see. And there's a fire brigade up, up ahead. And you can just see it. And you can also see the embers. The heat is just absolutely amazing. So um, this is uh, in my state, in uh, South Australia on Kangaroo Island. And you can see a car's just got overwhelmed. It, it, it stopped and the uh, victims inside were incinerated. And it gives you the, the devastation there, of what actually happens. The, the height of the fires is, is incredible. Um, you can see here a fire truck, a white fire truck. And I'll just run the video. And you can see the flames, the flames actually is higher than the fire truck. So this from a helicopter it doesn't look like much, but these flames are quite, quite long, quite high. And the, um, the fire front can extend for a long time. And so with these wildfires, people try to out drive them. But if there's a, a wind shift, you can see the flames now, but if there's a wind shift, the smoke goes the other way. And we're looking at hundred kilometers an hour movement of that smoke. And people trying to outrun it and drive through it, get covered in the smoke and they start running into objects and start running into each other. And there they stay. And unfortunately they get incinerated. Um, as they're running into each other, the victims are incinerated in these cars here. And it becomes a really difficult task to identify them. What, it, what is the problem is that with burnt evidence, there's no obviously no ridge patterns. Ridge patterns, what we're talking about is uh, fingerprints. So if there's no fingerprints or footprints or earmarks, or the, they're all totally gone uh, in these severe incinerations. Medical devices can be severely charred um, and we're looking at, we carefully removing those uh, serial numbers to see if we can help. Dental is usually fragile and this is what I'm going to talk about today. And DNA has problems of degradation. Um, where the fire brigade have been able to get two of two victims fairly quickly, um, there is a, a chance for DNA. But once you get over 250 degrees um, of, of all the tissue, there, there's no um, DNA able to be extracted. You can see this is the Grenfell Tower in London a year or two ago. And you can see the fire brigade can get up to a certain level, but above that, the, the, um, the victims were totally incinerated. And it didn't take long for the media to realize that the, uh, all the DNA is totally going to be destroyed. So it was dental did over three quarters of the victims uh, identifications. In the Victorian bushfires, which I worked on, you can see here, this is the dental is in the blue long column in the front and DNA is next to it. So most of the victims were identified by dental evidence. Um, but there was a problem. It took three months to identify them. So I'm going to go through why it took so long. The, there is a, a victim, hopefully you can see uh, two eyes there, nose, and there is the, the mouth, and you can actually see the lower jaw there with the teeth in, in place. Um, and this is at the scene. Now, when that head is lifted and moved and transported in the van back to the mortuary, they get vibrations. So you're getting this movement vibrations, and by the time you get into the mortuary, it's falling apart. And then we have to sift through it like a Humpty Dumpty going through all the little different pieces to find some dental material. And this is what was left from that original scene from that victim there. 
Um, this is another one. You might be able to just see a red arrow there. There's a maxilla, and you can see the palate and the upper teeth in place. Again, by the time it got to the mortuary, it's all in bits and pieces. We can identify um, people just with roots if it gets to over 700 degrees and we've lost the crowns. By how? Um, what we do is we're looking at the root morphology. We, we compare the roots to each other. So we compare the length to each other. We can play the, compare the angle to each other, the amount of bone between the teeth and the apices where the apices placed as well. So there's various lots of different things we can look at, even just um, we've got loss of the crowns and it gives enough information to form an opinion. Um, obviously we had more than just this slide. Uh, the other thing, sometimes if you've lost an amalgam restoration, you can see a white lining just beneath there. So this is diacal, which is an old insulation layer. The amalgam's been burnt off. This is the same tooth because if you don't take care, they're extremely fragile, this dental material, and you can see you actually could lose that information. But fortunately, we had one PA of it where we could see the diacal, the insulation layer in place. And this is the anti-mortem, um, part of the anti-mortem OPG. And then we could see that lining there and we can look at all those angulations. So we can identify things as long as the evidence stays together. Again, this is another car crash. And you can just see here that the uh, 2-4, the um, upper first premolar has been missing. So it's very important that uh, we take photographs at the scene. If we're not gonna be there, then at least we, I've instructed the police to take a portrait photo at least we can know what's there and what's missing and maybe do a probable or possible um, identification. Again, at the scene, this is that same case where we sort out what's what at the mortuary and unfortunately we're left in just bits and pieces. And once we get into this stage, we have to start working how, what have we got here? Do you, how good is your anatomy? So we start actually putting things together and seeing how it all fits. But what we're doing now is we're back at the scene, we had certainty, we knew how things fitted together. We now don't know. We're just giving an our uh, opinion of how we think things should fit, looking at our um, anatomy. And even if we got fully erupted, fully uh, intact teeth, sometimes we get the anatomy incorrect. So imagine with the charred remains trying to put this all together, it's quite difficult. So what we did was actually look, look back at the stabilizing materials from Mincer, Back in 1990, he tried different materials and he said that really everything does work a little bit, but we need to probably use it. And I was looking at why weren't they being used? Try these materials again to see what was the problem. I put in various parameters to see, is it readily available, easy to apply, non-toxic, transparent? It has to be radiolucent so we can take x-rays because with bird charred remains, it, you get a lot of the information from the x-rays. And also you wanted a reasonably rapid in setting time. So we place restorations into pig's heads. Um, uh, we do, um, at first, we incinerate them in the uh, animal crematorium and we, we could see how, how we went in stabilizing. Eventually this got fairly expensive. So we started doing sheet mandibles uh, in a furnace here, the, the mandibles down here, we place it into a, a muffled furnace and we incinerate it at high temperatures. And these are just amounts we just put in teeth and. This is from the incineration. And what we did, we used clear gloss enamel spray to spray the heads to, to see if that was enough to hold it together. Uh, we then placed it on a, um, a, a tile and then we vibrated it. It's not going to work. So um, once it vibrated, we, start, we sprayed one side with the clear gloss enamel, the other side we left as a control on the other half and to see which was lost and which was gained. And the ones that were treated, totally, we had a total of 28 attached from the total. Um, and non-treated, out of the total of 28, we had 17 detached. So we could realize, well, clear gloss enamel does work. We had to do another group because um, the petrol, the Dulux was the brand name, they changed the formula, so we had to test it again. And treated, we only lost two detached teeth when they were treated. Uh, similarly, we looked at fractures of, of the jaws and by treating it, you could really uh, minimize the amount of fracture and loss of, of uh, anti-mortem, uh, sorry, post-mortem tissue. There was a problem though. Clear gloss spray has toluene, xylenes, ethyl benzenes and C3 aromatics. 
So why is this so important? Petrol has toluene, xylenes, C3 aromatics. So if this is a murder scene and someone's been deliberately being incinerated, um, we've now in, in, um, contaminated the scene. So the police weren't very keen for us to spray heads at the scene. So we had to think about something different. So we had to look at different materials to see what else we could do to stabilize the materials. So I looked at water-based paints, similar. Xylenes and C3 aromatics were present. Uh, hairspray has ethanol, butanol, um, so it's not good. Cyanoacrylate has uh, ethanol and it's a methylmethacrylate, but also has toluene. So when you use cyanoacrylate, which is super glue, just we only use it really just for the minor cases, just to quickly seal up those anterior teeth. Um, PVA, which is the woodwork glue that has ethanol in it as well. So then I said, well, what if we, um, what if they did the testing at the scene before we sprayed? But they said, well, at the mortuary, they sometimes the pathologists like to also do further testing at the mortuary. So they still weren't very keen. So what we had to do is to look around different materials. Rather than keep burning heads, um, sheep's heads and pig's heads, I tried it in chucks to see what works the best. And uh, it's not working as well, but basically flour and water works best. I've tried arrowroot, cornstarch, dextrose, um, all these different materials, uh, natural products. And what I found out was flour and water worked extremely well. In Australia, we've got this material called uh, clag, which is basically just wheat paste and water. So flour and water, wheat paste and water on a 50-50 mix. And again, we got some great results similar to what we got with, pet, with uh, the paint. So treated, we only had two detached out of 44 non-treated, we had lost 24. And this has been um, written up and uh, on the article down below. Um, but the flower water spray, and again, treating the, just with flower and water without actually the, the clag spray, just with mixing it flower and water, not even cooking it. Again, we had a, a great result. Uh, to mix the wheat paste, it's actually on um, YouTube. Just look up how to make wheat paste. And people use wheat paste to put up posters and uh, use it's um, at children's classes and stuff. They tend to use that uh, flour and water mixture just as, and you need to dilute it enough so that you could spray it into the heads, onto the heads, just by using a, um, a common day spray that you use for ironing. Radiographically, flour does not interfere with radiograph. So you can still see those resins. This is resins we placed into sheep's teeth and then incinerated and sprayed them with the flour and water mixture. And they were perfectly clear. And you can see how fragile with all those cracks, how fragile those teeth are. Uh, following the um, animal experiments, we then used um, human heads. Uh, people donate their body to science and uh, for anatomy classes, et cetera, at the university here. And uh, what we did once they finished their dissection classes is to um, take it to the mortuary to, um, not the mortuary, sorry, to the crematorium to, to incinerate them. And so what I did was actually to test, test the incinerations. Um, this is a mandible that hasn't been sprayed and this one has been sprayed and it's gone. That, so these are heads, mandibles from the heads I've taken and I've put on a vibrating plate and uh, turn the volume down a bit. And you can see how quickly the teeth are lost in the vibrating plate. Yet this side that's been sprayed with the flour and water mixture totally stayed, this stayed intact. And even if I, I turned it upside down, it's still not a problem. The way, the way the material works is that being so fragile, you think, well, how does just by spraying the outside works? Well, what it does is actually joins over the top and also gets down into the fine cracks. So by getting down to the cracks as well as over the top, you stop the, stop the fracturing from propagating further. So by just holding it at the top, it doesn't allow the cracks as you lift it to move to for the cracks to keep going. So just by spraying it over the top, uh, you can hold these things, hold the uh, material to, together. To uh, make sure it sets quicker, we used to use a um, old floodlight, which generates a bit of gentle heat. If you ever stand in, a, in front of these old lights, they, they do generate a little bit of heat, which is gentle enough to allow the material to set. And and you can see there's a sprayed head. I apologize for the images here, but I'm, you can see it's for educational purposes. Flour and water spray, sprayed on the head. 
then use a light to set that material and, and um, it will allow it to then do a full examination. Um, the big problem though was it was fine until it got cold uh, and wet. Um, you couldn't allow the material to set. Also, the floodlights have now gone on to uh, LED lights. So the police and the emergency people don't use floodlights with the old filaments. So there's no more heat generation. So this would take quite a long time to do. So when it got cold, then it was a problem. But uh, I was reading Topoleski a couple of years ago, did an article on the, where that anthropologist used um, gelatin. And so I did some further studies using gelatin powder. And uh, you can mix gelatin with water and we test it again. Now, when you're using gelatin, so this is the uh, gelatin and you can, you just simply just mix it together. When you, when you mix it, I'll just do it here. When you mix it, you use a, a stirring motion. So you just mix it gently going round and round as a mixture. Um, it doesn't take very long to dissolve. You can see it's starting to dissolve pretty well here. But you just mix it for about a good minute and it'll work fine. What uh, is very important is if it's, it's tempting to mix it quickly is to shake it up, to mix it up. But if, if you shake this up to mix it, I don't know if you can see here, but it just goes all cloudy. So you've got this cloudy material on top that actually in, in a cool temperature starts to set. So you can't pour it into a, a spray gun to spray. Um, so this portable hand spray, you can't use it if it starts setting inside it. So just use a gentle mix when you're mixing this material. So it's this um, gelatin powder, just a teaspoon in, in some bit of water, mix it up inside, spray it on the head and it works really well. Um, again, we tested on the sheets, jaws. This is a lower mantle turned upside down. You can see the heat and you can start to see the loss of enamel from the teeth. I stopped there because eventually you would probably start to all deteriorate too further. We couldn't have anything else to hold together. And um, this is a video and this side's been sprayed and I actually added a bit of gelatin crystals on the outside. So uh, this is not needed. It's just, uh, it's, I thought well, this might be a good idea to speed the process but it doesn't allow the visual inspection as much. So I've now stopped putting the um, actual crystals on top. So I'll just show you the video. This half is sprayed. So with the vibrations like that, you can see how long the roots are and yet they come out easily, whereas the other half totally stayed the same. So I'll just go through that again. And you can see how effective that is to holding everything all together, simply by mixing a bit of gelatin and water together. And the results treated, 40 non-detached, and yet uh, non-treated, you're only able to keep five from uh, 80. So six grams, which is about a teaspoon to about 100 mils of, of water. And um, it, it works really well. I've, um, this art has been um, getting published at the moment. It hasn't actually been published, but it's been accepted for publication already and hopefully it'll come out pretty soon. Um, taking x-rays of it once it's been sprayed, similarly to flour, there was, wasn't a problem. You can see how fragile the teeth are, yet it held all pretty well together and it doesn't interfere with x-rays at all. Now I'm just gonna uh, go off on a tangent here because some victims, you won't feel they're totally incinerated, but you might be short on anti-mortem material. So if you're short on anti mortem material, you might be able to use a photograph or something like that. And this is not sufficient for Interpol to say, yes, it's definitely that person, but maybe you can exclude someone saying there's no way that could have that angulations of those teeth and the positions of the teeth. You can see here that the, the lower teeth are a bit of imbricated. So that this, this tooth is, is on the lingual and then that's uh, the 4-2 is lingually placed also, but then the 4-1 is more labially placed. And you can see that those of you who are clever can see that's probably a crown and this is probably a crown as well. So you can give an idea if it's possibly that person, possible or a probable, which will help a lot in a, especially in a large disaster. So this is what he looks like. Um, so this is what I'm saying about a charred part where this person has been burnt, but the fire brigade hasn't been able to put him out. 
In these sort of cases, we tend to use the super glue to hold it, just that bit of mepharm of acrylate super glue, cyanoacrylate, sorry, just gently over the top, not spraying it, just, just to run the glue over the top from in there. Um, you can see how the other teeth were quite clear, but if you, and you probably would have uh, be able to identify people if you had the anti-mortem information there, but if you only have the photographs and you've lost that, those anterior teeth, then you've gone in serious problems. So what to use in different situations? I haven't tried not to confuse you so much. So I've got a little table here, short burning time, cyanacrylate or super glue just on the upper teeth is probably all you need to do. Uh, where there's no testing for accelerants um, in a disaster, you can quickly get a spray can of uh, clear, clear spray and you can quickly put that all together and you don't have to mix anything, it's quite easy to do. Where it's very high temperature and low humidity, we can use the wheat paste, which is the flour and water mixture. Um, but in all other situations, usually gelatin, which I've just shown you late, just the last case, um, gelatin works really effectively. So in each situation, you can use a different material and you've got to make your common sense. There's a bit of an overlap between wheat paste and gelatin. Gelatin will work up to 32 degrees, not a problem as well. So. Uh, in Adelaide, we have these testing uh, facilities, so we can actually light fires inside these testing facilities and uh, these compartments. And uh, we place heads at different heights and we place wood inside and then it's all lit up. So uh, we light a fire and we incin totally incinerate inside here. We have monitors along the walls. We can actually test the temperatures uh, of the walls, the temperature inside at different heights and at which uh, which height the head is. Um, heads that are up high reach a higher temperature rather than heads that are down low. And so therefore you don't get less incineration, obviously. And that's just a clue. Um, sometimes you may not be able to get a direct area of spray. Um, and this is what I found with the flower and water initially. In this case, this is the head of a victim under a car accident. And uh, the fire brigade could remove the door to get to the victim, but if they did so, there'd be a lot of movement. So a quick shutter like that might lose all the material. So what I did was I laid down on the tarpaulin then and sprayed backwards and sprayed, sprayed the head. And then they could remove the doors uh, easily knowing that it's actually stabilized. And you can see this is just a, showing the, the flour and water mixture and how fragile all the material was. This is another case just to show the fragility and why it's so important holding things together. You can see the lower premolar there, it's literally come apart and come adrift a bit. But by spraying it, we have to hold that in place. What, not so importantly there, but actually it held half a molten restoration in that spot. And similarly, this has started to melt as well. Um, why was this as important is if you look now at the anti-mortem and you look down here on the bottom left, there are those restorations. And if that wasn't all held in place, we probably wouldn't have an idea where they actually came from. And an opinion of are we sure that came from those teeth. In another case, just to show um, sometimes with the trauma and the fires, like a car accident or an um, aircraft accident, you get a loss of tissue as well. This is the anti-mortem of this victim. And we thought, you know, well, great, we've got this um, endodontic root canal tooth there and pretty bad dentistry, so we shouldn't be a problem. Also tonight was this curved root and then there's that straight route and you look at the links and compare it to together. Because when it came to the post-mortem, there's that curved route and straight, but we actually had lost that upper six from the trauma, um, but we'd have to stabilize it. So we actually can do a comparison of the roots compared to each other. And we had some other little bit of information and we can then conclude that that is that person. Now, um, forensic teams, when we go to the scene, we want to, explain the event is what they, what the police want to do is explain the event and identify the victims. And this number two is what odontologists and anthropologists can assist in. So at the crime scene, they, the police would like to secure, separate the witnesses, scan the scene, see the, see over the whole lot of the scene, usually you have a drone or something like that. But we're mainly involved in six and seven, which is search for the evidence, search for dental evidence and anthropologists obviously for other tissues and secure the collection of the evidence. Um, the, it's not necessary for odontologists, obviously, to go to every case, but where you have a totally intact body, we know odontologists really aren't necessary. Uh, fragmented remains, the police are pretty good at, at picking up what's bits and pieces. They know what's, what's, what it looks like. However, once you start getting burnt and fragmented remains, 
they're still not too bad because they get, get some sort of an idea, but incinerated remains is probably where odontologists and anthropologists need to be because we can identify what burnt tissues look like and burnt teeth and burnt jaws. Um, and when they get incinerated and fragmented remains, sort of like a high speed accident, a vehicle accident, whether it's a train, plane, or a car, then it's a good idea to have from colleges. And especially if the, the remains are commingled, so there's more than one person at the scene. Um, there's evidence that if you leave it for too long, the, the, the material can deteriorate with time, but usually it's pretty stable. So there's really no rush to run to the scene because if you run to the scene and do a quickly grab everything you could see and not to properly document it and photograph everything, you could destroy the evidence that's there and you can get confused of what, do you, what did you pick up and from where. And you can contaminate the scene by stamping all over the scene and um, actually destroying evidence. So we need to have a standard operating procedure so you know what you're doing. Also, you need to work with the police. Um, so you work together as a team. Um, the police probably, uh, they will not invite you probably if you haven't talked to anyone first. So as odontologists, I um, really stress that you should visit your local coroner and say, hey, they make, make them aware that odontologists can assist in fires, but we need to be training with the police and so that we work together as a team um, because the police are unlikely to want to change their operating procedures to incorporate dentists because they're not aware how important it is to identify these victims and it hasn't been done in the past and assume that they can't be identified. So you need to go to the coroner and, and state, this is important, this is what odontologists can do. And in the, the fires from overseas, like the Victorian, uh, sorry, the, like the Victorian bushfires and the uh, Grenfell Town in London and um, other events, odontologists have been extremely successful, especially with our, as if odontologists can go at the scene and stabilize the remains and collect it, make sure it's stable. So, but you've also got to do your part and actually take time to train with them. Also, you have to prepare yourself. So uh, what we have is a prepared scene bag and that way it reduces preparation time because you've got everything all together. You're not going to forget anything and you don't have to start looking for everything, bits and pieces. So the things we might have at the scene are those sprays, um, and I'm just going to go through some of the small things that you need to make, some of the important things you might need there. When you first get a phone call to say that there's been an incident, uh, we run a scene running sheet. So we, whilst we're on the phone, we jot down who rang us and what time and where is the location, who's in charge, have we got the right equipment, have we got a Nomad, have we got other equipment there that we might need. How are we going to get there? Um, are the police going to drive us there? And um, what hazards there are that they know of? And later on, we're going to, once we, once we get back, we want to know the contact of the images. Has a debrief been conducted about it? And have you restocked all the, all the equipment from uh, when you've just come back? So when someone rings, we write down the date, the time, the place. This becomes then a legal document to say, well, we've got, I was asked to go to the scene by so-and-so and you've documented the time and place and you've signed, you've initialed it. And as you go for each section, you actually run this running sheet down to say actually what happened. Because you think you might remember, but at, at the heat of the moment, uh, you will, your mind's running along and your adrenaline's running along. And you think you might remember, but after the event, when it, there might be an inquest, where usually there is an inquest, um, it's difficult to remember all the little fine points of when you were there, what did you do? So by writing everything down, documenting everything correctly, you've covered yourself. And it, it looks great that you know what you're doing. Um, in equipment, make sure you wear enclosed boots because you'll be walking usually in scenes where there's broken glass, broken metal, and you and you need thick boots to protect your feet. I use a, a light that's inside a beanie um, because quite often if it's inside a house, usually electricity doesn't exist anymore in there. It's quite dark. You can still have this beanie underneath the, a helmet. And also that frees your two hands. You could take a torch, but that only leaves one hand to do, do stuff. And you need your two hands because quite often it's unstable. Goggles are absolutely essential because any bit of wind might blow out some dust and some embers, and you don't want any embers in your eyes. So you need to make sure you're wearing goggles. You need, as well as the examination latex or vinyl gloves, you need the thick leather gloves because you will be removing uh, the material over the top to get to the dental evidence. Need a knee pad. So this is just a thick pad 
to place down on the knees because Surprise, surprise, all the material's down on the ground um, and it's usually quite low. So you'll be usually on your knees looking for material dental evidence on the ground. Also, it's um, take your own provisions for food and drink. Usually you're going to be there for a few hours. So I like to take my own water, coffee, food in a separate little uh, container because in a disaster, no one prepares for it. No one knows exactly the disaster's going to happen there. And there's usually no electricity. There's... Um, Everything's, everyone's running around and, and being fed and having drink, something to eat and drink um, is the last priority. So I take my own now from experience. So if you, you've got your kit, you've rolled up to the scene, you, what the first thing you do is actually consult with the scene commander to get um, permission and you write that down on your, on your sheet, on your scene running sheet, when you turned up and who you spoke to. They'll be looking at a safe way to go in. They've probably done a drone over the whole lot to have a look at the, um, the area of, uh, of the disaster and discuss the safety issues present. I've got a little video to show that um, these scenes, once you have a fire go through, everything just tends to collapse. So you don't know where everything is. You've got to be careful where you're walking. What are you moving? Um, how dangerous is this all in there? It could be even snakes, uh, could be still um, anything in there. Also, you can see the smoke. You can see you can probably what's hot. You've got to be very careful making sure you're wearing those gloves, those thick boots. You don't have to wear all that when you first turn up. Um, this is at the, yourself at the scene. You check in with the um, scene officer there. This is my uh, another assistant odontologist carrying the bag. And we're just getting ready. You don't have to get dressed up yet. It's just many are running down, get a debrief of the situation. You then can get changed in what you might need to wear. You, um, helmets usually inside, um, inside in buildings because you never know what might fall down. Other safety issues, um, you could have unstable terrain, uh, you have residual heat, loose wires, sharp objects, chemical fumes and those embers I was talking about. You can see here in the Grenfell Towers, they're, they're all walking in protecting from any falling debris. Um, electricity wires, careful, don't want to be electrocuted, make sure you're safe. In Australia, we have these trees that come in from a central spot and the fire tends to still um, sit inside these trees and it can easily fall down. So just be careful where, and there are two victims inside this car. This is a victim laying down across the metal parts because he's been uh, supported by a metal frame, the flames can get underneath and it's totally incinerated. So dangers here, we've got electricity probably, We've got uh, maybe asbestos. We've got maybe the roof might tumble in. So there's various little things you've got to think about and you've got to discuss this with the police. The toxic substances, um, these the gases that are forming, uh, can either be, be carcinogenic or actually be toxic to you. One of the worst gases is this bottom one, carbon monoxide. When um, in any fire, there will be carbon monoxide being produced. Uh, what we do is uh, we have the fire brigade or the police to actually use these monitors, which actually have alarms when it reaches to a certain height of the carbon monoxide in parts per million. Um, why is this so important is you can't smell carbon monoxide. You can smell that something's burning in there, but you don't know the level. And at 3,200 parts per million, if you read that, you will get head headache and dizziness and nausea in five to 10 minutes, but you'll also be dead in 30 minutes. So once you get some headache and dizziness, you need to get out there because hemoglobin attaches to carbon monoxide 200 times better than oxygen does. So uh, just by going out means you won't be saved. Um, you need, because you need to be probably in a hyperbaric chamber, um, you need 100% oxygen supplied too. So you've got to really make sure these, you're wearing these monitors or get the, get the fire brigade to go in first to monitor the level. Uh, and an outdoor car, it probably doesn't matter, you've got plenty of ventilation. You can see the odontologists in there going in there spraying the head. You can see the intensity of the fire by looking at how the molten metal there. Um, you look at the scene here, you can see now where are the teeth? Well, what's a good hint is actually this area that's the skull cap. And the skull, the top of the skulls are in scenes when incinerations are quite easily recognized by the suture pattern. Um, you can see the, the bone sutures across the skull and usually you'll find the teeth are below there. So usually the teeth are on the ground and you can just see that there and there is 
the maxilla in place here with some loose teeth. Um, people in cars will tend not to be sitting up. They tend to try to crouch down low and their head's in that spot. You need to spray in from the side here. And this case where the head is totally lost, but we had this lower uh, edentulous mandible. And what we did find was actually porcelain teeth. So by making sure you collect all the bits and pieces there, we were able to uh, go to the lab and just find out what colour they used in their teeth and um, give you some idea. Obviously, it doesn't give it much, but any little bit of evidence might help the coroner decide, as well as the circumstantial evidence, who it is, because they don't like circumstantial evidence. When you go to a scene and you need to remove the body, as I said, quite often the fire brigade can remove these doors. So that way you get easy access to the victim. Um, but I like to go in and spray the head first before we do anything. and then to put a bubble wrap and then put a paper bag over the top before you lift the victim out of the car. And that way, if anything falls out, the, the paper bag, the bubble wrap and the paper bag will collect all the evidence so you don't lose it. So um, this is actually the person taken out, just showing the bubble wrap and wrap that up in the head. You then need to go back and collect the further evidence. Again, this is head over the top. If you haven't got a paper bag, any sort of soft material, just to take that all together, keep, it, keep all the uh, dental information all in the one spot so you're not searching through the whole body bag looking for material. Once the body's removed, need to go, this is an upturned car, need to go back in and look for further evidence. So what we do is we sweep underneath to see what other evidence we could find of the, of the human tissue. This is uh, Zaf Kuri gave me this piece of evidence here from New Zealand. Um, so this looks like a maxilla, this tiny little bit of evidence here, and that's, that's what they found. Now, taking an x-ray of this, what can we tell? Roughly, you can do an age estimation. Now, in that victim, you could see that the upper centrals haven't erupted fully, haven't, and haven't been still forming. These are the premolars, and there's the canine from the side. So you get a rough age estimation of that victim even if we can't identify that victim, we can then say this is probably this, a person of how much age. Now, the way we age estimation, you've probably heard lectures on this. We can use charts. This is uh, Sakir's chart here. And if you look at the chart, there's the centrals, there's the premolars still forming. So you're looking at about a six and a half year old, give or take one more year, one a year. So it's, it's not very uh, exact but it gives you some idea. It's not an eight and a half year old or a four and a half year old. It's around about a six and a half year old. Um, sometimes you might get lucky with dentures with a name imprinted on the, on the palate. The back of the palate's ideal because they don't use it with insulation with the rest of the body. They don't tend to get it burnt as much. Uh, cobalt chromes, the frameworks usually don't um, get altered at all, but you lose, tend to lose the acrylic. But just by having these two cobalt chromes, we can say what teeth are present and what are missing. So you then look up the missing persons. So you can say that probably the lower mandible, the four to four are present. And in the maxilla, you can see that the uh, two, two tooth is missing and it's been replaced by a single pontic there. And yet on this side, they, the one, two and the one, one were missing probably around the canine and the posteriors were missing there. So um, probably not enough, obviously probably not enough to totally um, establish someone but you can exclude that it's not that person, it's that person, but it's most likely to be this person because this is the dental pattern of extracted and missing teeth. Other material you might find are dental implants and um, just goes to show us asked to, to collect all the, the implants from a crematorium. And these are just screws. They're not actually dental implants, these three, but this is actual dental implants. So it just goes to show that we need dentists at the scene to actually pick up these materials. And so therefore they just don't think it's screws and, and it's uh, not important. Uh, in retrieval, uh, you can see this incinerated victim on a car seat. The Maryland Bridge was actually found beneath down low. So as I said, it's important to collect all the information underneath. Um, this Maryland bridge also, sorry, not, this is just a normal bridge that was collected, but you can see it lost total loss of material, but it's separated from the head. And this is here is the anti-mortem x-ray compared to the post-mortem. See it had an amalgam in there, but it gives probably sufficient evidence looking at the shape, the size, the length, and the morphology of that whole bridge 
gives you a fair bit of information in just one piece of retrieved evidence. Even if you've got um, part of a mandible and they've lost the teeth, what, what you can do, what you can do from here is actually give some of um, as well as age estimation, well, this is totally erupted. You can say, well, maybe the third models are present. You can see what teeth were present in the sockets and what weren't. So also you can look at the length of the roots that were in place. So you do some root morphology, just even when the roots aren't there by looking at the, the sockets that are, that are there, that remain. If you haven't gotten a plastic um, bubble wrap and a paper bag, you can put it in um, the remains in a bucket with some sand. The only problem is that with movement, they tend to sift in the sand and you need to sieve the sand when you get back to the mortuary. All that, has, all that sand has to be sieved to make sure you don't lose any evidence and you have to be very careful in sieving not to damage the material. Um, just going back how important these little bits of information you pick up afterwards. This is from the Victorian bushfires and it's very hard to see anything there. And just by having the crowns of the teeth which have popped up, why are they so important? Well, if you take a X-ray of that, so we take a photo, we take an X-ray, you can see that that person had an upper central with a, with a resin in there, also had an upper molar with an occlusal amalgam filling on there. So you can then go back through the missing persons and to see who had a resin there, who had a, as well as a upper um, molar amalgam. Roots, all little bits and pieces of roots in place. So why is this important just to collect all those bits? Well, you never know, you might get lucky and find a root canal there. Also, you've got the morphology of the roots that are in place. In the loose remains, um, this is uh, by the Bushes and uh, Ray Miller. Um, you can look at, pick up the bits and pieces, could have actually resins that have popped out of the, out of the crowns. And through the X-ray fluorescence, you can then determine what material they're made of and does it match the anti-mortar material. Um, this is the portable XRF there and it's been published so back in, in Journal of Forensic Science. The, um, the remains also, once you pick them up, you can respray them and you can pick up all the bits and pieces just so they don't fall apart on the way to the mortuary. You can see how fragile these pieces are. It, it wouldn't take much for them to lose it. And get something like that where it's encased in bones, not too much of a problem, but still spray it again. You can see here, this was anterior part was lost and by placing into a little container, similar to one of these containers, and put a bit of uh, bubble wrap or even light towel on there, just to protect it, give a bit of cushioning effect helps. You can take an X-ray at the scene uh, of all the little bits and pieces as well, if you've got a um, portable Nomad and a, something like an X-ray portable sensor unit. Just make sure when you do take an X-ray that you make sure you align the tooth as they would be in the mouth. So there's no use taking this lower premolar and having it laying down sideways when really you want to, to match what was possibly in the anti-mortem information. So you need to bits of foam on either side just to get that in the correct orientation to make sure you'll be able to match it to anti-mortem radiographs. So this is just taking some x-rays. You can see the sockets, these are just moving out a little bit. You can see this um, cantilever bridge doesn't take much for it to lose that. So if you take it at the scene, you've got this information and you've got the relationship of this bridge to these this premolars. So um, it just gives you that little bit of um, certainty if it, came, if it doesn't fall out. Um, around the head, you'll find that people will protect their head and you'll find sometimes watches and earrings and other uh, circumstantial levels that will just help with the police. As I said, implants, Usually with porcelain, you don't get the, um, the porcelain tends not to melt. So you get the crowns of, on top of the implants are still present. Also, you might be able to find um, fixture devices, which the, the police aren't usually recognizing, but you could actually help them in, in finding these little bits of, material, bits of materials and collect them. Um, once the body's been collected and you collect all the material, make sure you transport it flat. So place a board beneath the board for body for support. There's no, you can imagine what's going to happen here. All the material is down, just fallen down all into one big hump. And you can imagine the damage that was done. So place a board for when, you, when you're carrying the body and, and making sure that you also tell the driver of the funeral uh, van or whoever's taking the body to the mortuary to be careful. Because also I like to ring the mortuary up to say there's an incineration case coming 
um, and to be careful because once it's bagged in a body bag, you don't know that they don't know the condition of that body um, unless I've been told. So the other thing is to do is actually to write on it. So as well as ringing them, write on the bag. So write, this is the head, this end, um, it's the odontologist, this is the um, number, the serial, the human remains number in there. And this is for forensic odontology to check. So that the um, mortuary technicians know that this is a, an incineration case and that odontology should be involved. And you can see here in, uh, in America that during this, uh, the bushfires there, you can see them writing down all this information. So in summary, work with the police for safe access. Go to the coroner first um, because you're more likely to be invited to assist. Uh, once you provide the, I don't mind if you use this video to show the coroners, um, to show what we can do and what odontology can do in identifying people. Because remember, there's no DNA, there's no fingerprinting, uh, we're it. And uh, if they don't utilize us to stabilize the remains, they're probably unlikely to get closure for these families. And they, the families want to know why. Um, sometimes we can't get to the scene, so I've also instructed the police. So our CSI guys now carry a kit um, this is the, um, the gelatin. This red and white thing is actually the clag, which is the wheat paste solution in there. And there's some water and, and this is the spray gun to spray the, the heads with. And that's in every single CSI kit in South Australia now. So that way, if they again come across an incineration case, they can spray the heads. This gives an idea of the, uh, the fires there, but thankfully you can start seeing the greenery start to come back. Thank you very much. Um, this is my website. If you've got uh, other questions you can't think of today, also I'm obviously on LinkedIn and Facebook and all the rest of the, the other sort of media bits and pieces there. But uh, thank you very much for listening and I hope I might have changed your lives in some small way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, the same problem. Uh, now my video is not starting. Unable to start uh, the video. I think you should make me the host then. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, is that working? No, it's not. No, I'm sorry. Post. Sir, it's working now. I guess it's working now. Huh? Yes, it started. It started. Excellent. Okay. okay. Uh, it, it was great, great, uh, great amalgamation, great compilation. Uh, before uh, we start over with the question answers thing, uh, I have mm, two questions which were popped up to me, and uh, I'll I'll shoot it to you. And then uh, before that, uh, you know, uh, uh, cyanoacrylate cement, as as I know, what I've been uh, because I was uh, trained in Central Forensic Laboratory, Chandigarh where uh, uh, Pathanko 2016 uh, attack happened and when uh, there was not availability of much of equi equipment and material at the site where the attack took place. So uh, they gave me a list, you know, I, they, I searched the literature and, I, and gladly I could find your two articles which were there, I, I should quote you. Uh, that's why I said that I saw you two, uh, four years before I met you, I had seen your paper. The oh. paper was... Uh, the paper was in legal medicine, and uh, I think you had used sheep, um, sheep, Manible. sheep mandibles to really uh, uh, replicate the incineration. One was that, and the second one was some some kind of a, a, a glossy spray you used in another yeah. article. Where uh, uh, and both of them were uh, amazing. I, I saw one more Indian article by uh, Risu. Uh, it happened in Malan Azad, and then uh, uh, they they compiled, and that was cyanoacrylate clear acrylic spray paint, hair spray, spray varnishes, clear fingernail polishes, varnishes, quick setting epoxy resins. And uh, 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 those were uh, the kind of uh, things suggested when there's nothing to really go about. These might, you might find in household uh, uh, thing. Uh, anything you want to add more, which can be used. The big problem there in a lot of those materials is that you can imagine doing nail polish, uh, you start touching it is the problem. And you don't use a hairbrush or you don't use a nail because as soon as you start touching it, it will move. It will so, and, and I said the other thing with the gloss spray was eventually as the police found out as I'm contaminating the scene 
So with a volatile lick, and if they're doing testing for accelerants, that was the problem. So do not touch as much as you can. The only thing you do is the super glue for the uppers where it's only slightly charred. But um, a lot of the other materials have problems in that you're trying to touch it. And you can imagine cyanide super gluing a whole head. Also, once you've super glued and you've, you've joined the arches, you can't separate them. <laughs> you know, so, you know, it's, it's a problem. I, I think, I think uh, 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 with a medical officer there or a crime scene investigator, he might not allow you to touch even. You know, he might tell you, you, you can watch the body from outside or you can click a picture. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, usually uh, uh, till, till it re reaches the mortuary for a, a forensic or ontologist to take an expert, it, it, it becomes a little difficult to really even touch because the crime scene... Well, see, this is why you need to educate them first. Yes, sense so if We need to educate to show you need to stabilise it because if we don't do this, you are going to get a body back to the mortuary, but you're not going to identify that person. Two, uh, quick, two quick questions to you. Uh, one... Um, I'll be failing in my duty as a panelist if I don't ask you any modifications in the new normal pandemic of incineration uh, things if, if it happens, God forbidden. Uh, any, any modifications you suggest which might be safety for the body as well as to the person who is investigating as well? Yeah, that's why we use the gelatin in the water. The gelatin is just the way to use it is to spray it. And so this is the latest innovation is using I've tried uh, agar, but that actually started setting in the spray bottle. And uh, COVID-19 setup, COVID-19, where we have to be safe from the body fluids by ourselves as well. Yes, yes. So these right. sprays uh, are, uh, you know, not, a, you know, droplet kind of a expansion no. takes place. No, actually, you know, with cyanoacrylate um, super glue, is that if you do spray that and you get in the eyes, um, it's impossible to remove from your eyes uh, because you can't see it. Uh, so cyanoacrylate is very dangerous to use as a spray. You know, when the fingerprinting people use cyanoacrylate fume covered, uh, it's extremely dangerous material. Uh, so you do not want to go spraying your right. But I mean, is that you've got to be careful uh, using that. But uh, the gelatin, it's it's safe. It's a it's a reason when it's made from different animal products, whether it's fish, cows, or or pigs, it can be all different animal products can be used in gelatin. And I don't know what in each country they have a certain gelatin material made so it's available everywhere it's cheap and uh, it as I said it didn't take much to mix up and uh, you can then spray in a little spray bottle all, all, adv all advantages uh, uh, preparation is important and you need to get yourself to talk to the coroner and then the police so you know they know then that you're available because you don't know what's going to happen um but I, i'm sure there'll be more fires at, uh, with this okay. <laughs> unfortunately um, yeah. buildings it, it's yeah. my personal problem, which I face uh, very often. Uh, I see the police not sensitized much about photographing a, you know, a body which is there uh, before stabilization. After, are you just suggested, you know, a uh, lot of photography happening or, uh, or a scanning happening? What, what exactly is your take? Uh, because they are having a, a point and shoot camera maybe or anything to keep yeah. next to it so that, you know, this, when we develop it, there is no distortion or there is no, uh, the development takes place in a life-size manner. Anything you suggest? Oh, well, um, we actually, when we go to the scene, I actually get the police involved in taking a photograph, oh. get them to actually take the photograph. And you can use a ABFO number two ruler uh, inside looking at the size and shape, obviously, as well. And- um, Not available? Yeah. If ABFO not available, ABFO scale not available then? What do you then suggest? You can use anything that you know of a set, set scale. Scale or a, scale or a circle. Scale. Any scale will be fine knowing them there because we're not looking at a bite mark pattern or anything like that. We're just looking, no. at, looking at size and shape. And the other thing I found out is as I go to, as odontologists come to scenes, is that we've got the placebo effect of the police all of a sudden will look after the tissues more and the head more better than if we don't, weren't there. And they all of a sudden don't want to be told off or want to be, you know, looking at us scathingly. So they will tend to look after the, the, dentition more and we're also by getting them involved by saying look well can you take a photo of this can you take a photo of that and then you get that you know the running sheet who you spoke to and who took the photograph so you get them so obviously you've got access to those photographs um but get them involved and that the, well, so, like, work, so it's a lot of lot, it's a lot of psychology uh yes, happening here. <laughs> yes exactly you gotta, gotta you, all right you I, 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 ontologist. <laughs> yes 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 Okay, uh, uh, there is a question. Uh, are you at Adelaide offering 
any kind of uh, DVI trainings or maybe a short term, a 10 day week, anything where people can come for observership, uh, paid, uh, paid, unpaid? It's difficult because with COVID, you can't get in Australia at the moment. Uh, this will be, have to be on hold. Um, we uh, we would be probably happy eventually to do it, but uh, currently we can't even travel between states. Uh, so at the moment, our teaching's been minimal. When we teach, we've been, not even our postgrad students can enter the mortuary. Uh, we had to use dry skulls and get them to practice taking intraoral x-rays that way. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, but- Maybe, maybe post-pandemic, most, most post, yeah. post-pandemic maybe. Yeah, it's a postgraduate course. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm saying uh, maybe post pandemic, pa pandemic you can uh, yeah. you can yes. think of. Hopefully, yes. Yeah. Uh, watch this space. I can't really commit myself either, one way or the other. But that'll be good. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, any any more questions popping up? Please, uh, please go ahead. Uh, how do you preserve? Uh, this is uh, Gabriel M. Uh, Fonseca uh, is asking. Uh, how do you preserve remains after examination if you need to examine them again? Because uh, they'll be kind of, uh, I think, uh, uh, every, uh, there are religious beliefs of disposing the body of somehow, maybe burning, burning, or uh, uh, there are various other means. So uh, yes. what, what is the best way to preserve them uh, as records? What, what records you suggest, uh, list of records you suggest? Obviously, we do a, a visual inspection. At first, we then, document everything we can see from a distance without touching anything and then we the intraoral radiographs now if you can't do intraoral we use now ct scanning uh we're fortunate our mortuary this year the government because they knew that that with the covid they got a ct scan in the mortuary so we ct scanning the mortuary so that has a permanent record of them if you haven't got a, a ct scan and you're worried about damaging the evidence putting placing in because you can go usually underneath the jaw to get the, the uh, intraoral x-rays. You can actually put a digital x-ray sheet from the outside and, and shoot with a beam going underneath, similar to that side. So um, I always take external x-rays and photographs as much as possible first before trying to separate the jaws. Because once you've separated it, you've damaged it and you've got evidence. But it's a matter of being thorough. Take your time, be thorough. And that way you've got all the records in, in, intact. Uh, it's a good question because you don't want to, um, you want to make sure you're not in a hurry. You just, you've got to be more important because you only get one shot at it. And you looked at that tooth where I took a x-ray of it and then I wanted to get the whole tooth and I actually touched it and, I, and it fell apart. So yes, it's, it's a matter of being thorough. Take the x-rays from the sheets from the outside as much as possible and make sure you, you kept your evidence and also we retain the evidence we also have a backup of all the information uh off-site so we have a backup so we don't lose the digital information as well so uh are you inquiring months afterwards it's it's not usually the inquiry there's inquiry about a deficit it's usually not next week it's uh, usually a long time afterwards mm -hmm. so you want to have all your records there money sheet there and okay that's great uh I think I think we uh, we are uh, through with the questions and such. If they are there, they can email you or they can uh, uh, contact me. Or... Yeah. They, they, they'll be that will be great. And uh, we have had a great session. I oh, I pass over to Doctor uh, Abirami. Where is? She's yes, sir. There. I'm here only, sir. That's it. Uh, that was a very nice lecture. And after uh, uh, after uh, so many months, I I learned. Um, like nice uh, things from uh, John Boykita, sir. And uh, that was a nice question, the preservation of remains uh, in, in the examinations and all. That is from Dr. Uh, Gabriela, I guess so. And then, uh, sir, I'm thanking you, Dr. John Boykita, you. sir. You took so much of risk and then you just uh, gave a nice lecture, sir. And behalf of my uh, dental college, Savita Dental College side and uh, my uh, academic directors, I like to thank my academic director, Dr. Deepak Nalaswamy, sir. And then I like to thank my dean, Dr. Shija. And then my whole department, whole pathology department, I like to thank. And my HOD, very supportive HOD I got, Dr. Harold Shirley. And then my department staffs, everyone I like to thank. And uh, Dr. Raman Chaudhary, sir, <laughs> you are here today <laughs> because of you only it went well. and. <laughs> I think the team also, it, uh, it, it was working very nicely, I guess so, sir. 
we're, we're very blessed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Dr. Bhagara, you can see the certificate for your yeah, we sent to you. And yes. uh, good seat, Savita Dental College, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Vishnu Priya, uh, Dr. Shijas Bargesh, and uh, Deepa Nalaswamy, Dr. Deepa Nalaswamy, and Dr. Abhinami. Um, it was great having you. Uh, Thank you. And it was great, great to pass on this knowledge, and it's great to see you as well. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you, Thank you so care. much, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Abraham, for organizing. Thank you so much, sir. Bye.